Hello, welcome to 30 Minutes. I'm Rick Anthony. I've always wanted to write a novel. I got close. It was a short compilation of articles, I, business articles I've written during my career. Uh, the royalties from my little book would barely pay for a one-course meal at a diner, but it was fun, and at least I can say I wrote a book. My guest today is a bona fide author. Uh, she has, in fact, written six mystery novels uh, and is uh, probably going to complete a series of 12, I'm sure. What distinguishes Barbara Clement is that the people and places in her novels all take, are all from the main line many of whom you'll recognize if, you, uh, if and when you read the book. Uh, the, the title of her sixth novel is Visions. I started reading it last night, and, and I was grabbed in the first few paragraphs. It's really quite good. You'll enjoy reading it. Barbara, uh, nice to see you again. It's good to be back, Rick. Thanks. It's been a full eight years since we sat at this table when you had your fifth release. It has been. Uh, of course, a lot of it has occurred since that time, but... It's really good to be back, and I am really happy to be introducing Visions. And I'm sure, I hope you noticed the wonderful new studio. It's gorgeous. It really is. Uh, I started reading Visions, as I said, uh, and was grabbed by the first few. It just comes at you right away. It comes right off the page. And so the first question I have is, how do you do that? Is I, I don't want to trivialize it and say, is it formula writing? The, the way good authors, they know they have to do certain things. But it's the detail. I mean, you can you can vision who it is, circumstances coming out of, and so on, right on the first page. Well, in in the case of visions, it really started with a real life accident, car accident here on the main line, and I picked up one of the local newspapers, and I thought, my God, that's horrible. And I started to read a little bit about the uh, way that the accident had occurred. And that is really what was really? kind of the acorn. But a few weeks later, there was a major fire on the main line. And this became very mysterious because uh, the owners of the house were really not the owners of the house. They were renting the house. It was behind gates. And who were these people and how did the fire start? So this began to gel at that particular point. Uh, but I do not write from an outline, and I don't write from formula. I write as it occurs. In, in my mind, mm -hmm. I sit there, and it just kind of comes out. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy it. it. For me, it's like a, a mental drama. Mm -hmm. As I'm watching my mind <laughs> go, i yeah. writing it down. Well, this is your sixth. It's the sixth. Has it gotten easier over the years? No. <laughs> as a matter of fact, it's gotten harder. Really? Uh, it involves a lot of research. And as you probably know, with all of the books, if you read about something happening or occurring, you can usually Google yes. it and find out that indeed such a thing has occurred. Uh, in this particular book, of course, which occurs, there's lots of mystery. Uh, there's lots of geography. Yes. So I had to go back uh, and do a lot of study of geography, especially in Italy, yes. areas that I didn't know anything about. Uh, there is a mention of a U.S. base, a mm -hmm. military base in one of the places. And uh, a friend of mine said, does that base really exist? And I said, yes. And he said, I've never heard of it. And I said, no, a lot of people haven't. <laughs> so in the fiction, um, certainly the characters are not real. Those are... But they seem to mirror real life people along the main line. They are in yes. sort of combination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, but that, we don't want to admit that. That's part of the fun of reading the novel, because I think I know who she's talking about. Oh, well, of course, as you well know, I was with one of our favorite universities, and uh, I very much love the Augustinians. I mean, yeah. They are truly wonderful. And there are a couple of priests that are in the book that are kind of a combination mm -hmm. of those particular mm -hmm. Augustinians. They're called Edmonites, mm -hmm. after St. Edmund. But Barbara, you've had a storied life yourself. It's been exciting, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> to say the uh, least. Starting with a stint uh, with the uh, U.S. intelligence agency. With one, yes, I, we won't tell which one, but right. Uh, literally right out of college. I mean, I was in my senior year when I took the test uh, after I was approached uh, to take it. I had no idea what it was. Uh, I came home after I had been approved, and, and I said to my father, I'm going to work for XXX, and he said, Never heard of those people. Are you sure that they're all right? <laughs> he was sure he was sending his daughter off to some yeah. God knows what. 
Was, was that a lark, or did you plan no, to go into government service? I had no idea. Um, originally, I wanted to go to law school. So I was in a three-year program where the fourth year would have been law school. Uh, then when this came along, I thought, why not try this? It involved travel. Mm -hmm. I would be trained and live in Washington, D.C., and then be sent off someplace. And little did I know that that was going to be the start of really uh, a career which would take me all over the world and to some very unusual places. I'll bet. Yeah, uh, things and places you can't talk about. I understand. But you went from that into public relations? I did. Um, <laughs> international public <laughs> international relations. International public relations. But I never lost the other contact. That was the uh, interesting thing is that uh, you know, there was that old saying in the God for the just when you think you wear off, they pull you back in again. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm a writer. I started to write a column for the Staten Island Advance. Nobody's ever heard of the Staten Island Advance. And my uh, first husband uh, was with a, a consulting company, and they didn't like their wives working. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were supposed to stay home, serve tea, and that was about it. But I really wanted to do something because my husband was traveling all the time. There was a job opening at the Staten Island Advance for someone who was supposed to be writing a fashion column. And I said to him, I really want to apply for this. And he said, well, it doesn't take too much of your time. Remember, you've got to serve tea or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In fact, so I did. Uh, I got the job. And it was supposed to be three columns a week. Well, that began every day, and then every day, and then he was going to Europe, been transferred to Europe. And, uh, I, at that time, what I didn't know was that the Staten Island Advance was the headquarters for the Newhouse Empire. We're sitting at a table over here, and the distance from this table to that glass over there was the distance from my little desk to Sam Newhouse's Empire mm -hmm. office simple man, and he'd just come up and like what you're doing. So one column became, of course, three columns a week, became five columns a week. Then they put it out in syndicate, and it became a syndicated column, which they then sold to the Chicago Sometimes Daily News Service, and that was the beginning. Marvelous. And everything, everything, everything leads to something else. Not planned. Yeah. It just it just happened. And like so many journalists, you ended up in public relations. I did. I did. Um, and that was a little bit by coincidence. Again, I went to interview Mrs. Estee Lauder. And Mrs. Lauder was just a delight. No one, I think whoever met her and interviewed her wouldn't say that she was a combination of very strict businesswoman, but she had this kind of a loving grandmother mm -hmm. touch to her too. And our one-day interview turned out to be a three-day interview. The one column turned out to be a series of several columns that ran nationally, and she loved them. They were among her favorites. So that when the time came that I was uh, thinking about moving on, uh, I got a call and went to work for Mrs. Lauder. Mm -hmm. And that led to a nice, long decade career of traveling all over the world with her and alone into all sorts of other countries around the world uh, where Estee Lauder was establishing itself, including... Were you Eastern. her personal representative No, I was agent? vice president of international public relations, uh, and that meant all countries outside of the United right. States. No, she was, she was the head of the company, and uh, if she was traveling, however, mm -hmm. and because I would know the press <clears throat> in those countries... She would be there, and then I would say, we meet and say, you yes. got four interviews today, or, you know, you have an opportunity for six. Do you want to do, she'd say, I'll do two of those. And that's how we would work it out. Mm -hmm. And your <laughs> marriage to Charlie, to your yes, late husband, my late brought husband. you back to Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Um, my father-in-law was ill. And we were making the run, as they used to call it, between Manhattan and the main line a couple times a week sometimes because mm -hmm. his heart was not good. And finally, my husband said, you know, I think we really yeah. should do this. And we did. And that's when I went to work for Villanova. Villanova, yeah. Which I was thrilled to do. Mm -hmm. And that was another decade. <laughs> but when did you start writing novels? I started after I left Villanova, 
and it was uh, retirement is a very difficult thing for some people. Oh. I'm one of those people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I had a hard time doing it. And my husband said, "Look, you've always wanted to write a mm -hmm. book. Why don't you sit down and try to write a book?" And so I did, and that was the first the first. But did you have in mind that it would be a mystery or simply a work of fiction? I had no idea what it was going to be. <laughs> okay. All in right. fact, it's called Legacy of Deceit which is based a little bit on, on some adventures of the family, uh, which I won't go into because I won't have a family after that. But uh, that was the first one, and that was such fun. Mm -hmm. And it was it went to a publisher quickly. Yeah. It was picked up very fast, yeah. which was a surprise. Barb, I've read that your philosophy of life is summed up in this phrase, you bloom where you're planted. I believe that, Rick. Yeah. Uh, Ela uh, elaborate on that. How, well, how, how has that played out in your life? I, I uh, definitely have a religious background, and you know I'm very much a believer in God. And I think that oftentimes the uh, things that look really inopportune for us are really opportunities that are just in disguise a little bit. And it's those opportunities that really allow us to kind of move ahead, move up a step right. ladder. Uh, if you are in a situation, as we've all been, I'm sure, uh, that is not good, the first instinct is to escape it. But it's, and it's not that you shouldn't try to escape a bad situation, but you should also look at what is going to be the best way to do this that can actually help me personally to move ahead. So rather than just running away from it, see if there's nothing, if there's not a kernel of something within that, sure. that suggestion that can move you ahead. And I think it does. Uh, we talked a little bit about the fact that I had some health problems a while back. Well, you're a cancer survivor. That's right. And the there was a brain freeze, no doubt about it. Um, writing was one of the best things I could have done because I was literally sitting there thinking, I, I can't find the words. And when you are forced to sit down and write, gradually, 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 it starts to come mm. back. And I, I really credit that kind of a, a stress on the brain, which is like exercise. Yes, sure. That's what yeah. it is. Um, but you were almost given up several times over the well, since I last saw you eight years ago. Uh, what what could you have possibly learned from that experience uh. when everybody was <laughs> praying? For, People were praying that I'd... <laughs> for your, your demise to get you, they get you I was out, dead. Of, out of your suffering. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty remarkable when after you survive a very long illness that, and people think you're going to die, yeah. you're related because I'm saying, oh, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, you know, here she is. Um, I, I, it's, a lot of it is very funny because, of course... I you have to laugh. laugh. You have to laugh. And... And then you begin to appreciate the fact that you have people who love you. And uh, they were there. They were there all the time when you were not. But I would think maybe there's something else, Barb. You have to ask yourself, uh, why am I still here? Is there still something else I'm supposed to do? I, 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 I can tell you in my case, my vintage, I keep wondering, what else am I supposed to do? All of my, not all, most of my friends have brought on to their rewards. Yes, to their mind as <laughs> My well. My contemporaries. <laughs> yes. So what's left for me to do? What does he have in mind for me? Well, I, I agree with you. I think that that is exactly what I've been. I, I oftentimes think the same things, and, and I do wonder. Um, you know, I, I most of my family's gone. In fact, I would say all of them are gone. <clears throat> and thank God for my husband's family because they're, <clears throat> they're as close to me as, as <clears throat> anyone could be. But I thought, think at times they had their doubts that I was going to come out of it. <laughs> We're wondering who was going to take care of my cat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, back to your writing. Uh, you introduced this character, this protagonist, Jessica Rollins, yes. early on. And she has continued to play through each of your books. What, what do you have planned for her? <laughs> Will she go off a cliff you. at some point? No, with your last no, book? no, I can't. I, listen, she's, she and I are the same. And, you know, I kind of live through her. Uh, I'm, of course, already writing a seventh, as you can imagine. Sure. And she's yeah. definitely in the seventh <laughs> book. We're not, we're not doing away with her yet. Um, I don't think she wants to be done away with. 
but she certainly is off on many adventures. And the uh, interesting thing is that while in real life she might have been retired a long time ago, mm -hmm. somehow they just keep bringing her back and she keeps on having these incredible adventures. Yeah. And in Shadows, uh, of course, she you know, was off into uh, Germany and in, in discovering all sorts of terrible things. In Visions, she is into the Vatican. And while movie stars might someday play her, believe me, they're not going to be playing a glamorous person waltzing around the halls of the Vatican. Mm -hmm. This poor woman is on her hands and knees working to scrub the floors mm -hmm. in the Pope's private apartments. There are real groups. Um, I do name the groups, by the way, uh, in the Vatican who are assigned to this. These are women, not unlike nuns, who live, their only purpose is to serve the, Vat the yes. priests, and especially the Pope. And they are on their hands and knees, they are very strict, and many of the people, they consider them kind of the uh, mistress rulers of the place, because they will, you better do what they tell you to do, mm -hmm. or you're not gonna be, even if you're a Monsignor mm -hmm. or a Bishop, you're not gonna be friends to them, you're out of it. But it, it was a good lesson in what really goes on behind closed doors there. Uh, I wondered about your interest, uh, almost fixation, on the Vatican. Uh, well, what, what accounts for that, <laughs> the vagaries of the Vatican? As you probably will remember, Villanova University was the first, and as far as I know, the only university in the world that had Vatican interns. Uh, these were students who were selected to work in the Vatican Communications Office. And uh, you and I worked on this together. Barb, and that was my program. It was your program. I brought it to Villanova. That's right. Yeah. And we did. And yeah. it was, I'm always it's very proud of that. still going strong. Oh, it's, still going strong. Well, we have two of my people that I'm very, still keep in touch with and I'm very yeah. grateful. They have never forgotten their experience. Uh -huh. And Sister Judith, oh my. Wonderful nun. She's was, retired, isn't she? Oh yes, yeah. a number of years ago. Yeah, but she was she was something. Yeah, she, she was. taught those kids. They learned. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, back to your interest in the Vatican. What, what accounts for that? Well, I, th I think. And, and how did you get into the inner circle so you understand the the intrigue? in the Vatican, Vatican City. There was really a lot of research on that. I mean, I, I can only tell you that that took a lot of... Well, regrettably, a lot of it has been in the public press. That's exactly right. Um, when the our program uh, with the Vatican interns was still going on, I took a trip to the Vatican uh, to see what was happening there and was able, through one of our wonderful Augustinians, to get a pass into the Scavi which is the underground city mm -hmm. uh, underneath St. Peter's Basilica. Right. That is a fascinating, fascinating place to be. And for anyone who's uh, able to write to uh, uh, his or her bishop and get mm -hmm. a pass to that, it's something to see. That part of the book is based on that. I did see where St. Peter's bones are, which is beneath the altar. I did walk on those paths, which are underground mausoleums where a lot yes. of early Christians are buried, but also a lot of pagans. These were the people that were before the Christian era mm -hmm. who are living or were living in the area and were buried in these mausoleums. So that part is all authentic. Uh, and a lot of the other part is just research, just sitting down and reading the books and looking at it. Do, do you always know how a story here your stories are going to end? No, I never do. You don't? And the reason... So some authors, as you know, they start from the back and they write back to the beginning. But if you do that, what you're doing is allowing your readers to understand too, because readers are not stupid. They, they listen to what you're writing and they begin to form conclusions. So if you know that the end is over here, you have to be giving them little kernels of information along right. the way. But there are times when it's more fun to be surprised. Sure. And but, I think But if you don't know how it's going to end, and this is a different question, yes. I think. Do you know when it's going to end? No. Okay. Neither neither one. I mean it just it just happens. Yeah. Uh sometimes I, I'm surprised myself and say, Well, I didn't know that. 
How much rewriting do you do? Not a lot. Um, I, I will tell you that the book I'm writing now is very complicated. And because I feel like I'm still not back to my, uh, from my mental freeze, mm -hmm. uh, I have a harder time coming up with words. Mm -hmm. uh, the research is still there. Uh, this is a very different kind of a book having to do with communications. And what is happening in the world of communications today is startling. It is a mystery, though. It is a, oh, yes, oh, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, plenty of people get killed in this one. <clears throat> do books after, even this is your sixth, and I don't know how many manuscripts there were before you were first published, but do books at a certain point, b b novels particularly, begin to write themselves? They do. You sit and you just wait for the inspiration and you just it just channels through you. That's exactly what, that's what it does. That's what it does. Really? And, you know, I will... I Does that happen to all authors or only the best in your case? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I know that there are some it doesn't. I know that uh, friends of mine who know James, James Patterson. Yes. His, of course, you know, he writes from... A lot of people don't know this, but he writes from a panel. He has a whole bunch of guys and gals sitting around a table, and he sits at the head of the table. And he says, okay, I'm passing out this outline... And this is going to be a mystery about uh, the U.S. Navy. Uh, I want, let's see, it's Monday by Thursday. I want each one of you to come up with a storyline based no on this. Kidding. That's the way it's done. Then they'll say, Rick, we like yours. Yeah. You are chosen. You'll be the writer for this one. And Hazel, you will write with him. So the two of you. However, we're going to name Mr. So-and-so as the prime author. Right. <laughs> so unfortunately, some celebrity yeah. will be the author. Wick with Rick Anthony yeah, and Hazel yeah. Brown. Unfortunately, you're really the authors. I knew there were ghosts, but I didn't oh. realize that some of the most prominent authors never, were, touch, never touch it. <laughs> really? <laughs> they never touch the book. Oh. So when you say James Patterson with blank, blank, blank. Yeah. Next you're going to tell me there's no Santa Claus or Easter book. Right. <laughs> we won't <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> What, what other authors have influenced your style over the years? The one main author that I absolutely love is Lawrence Durrell. And uh, Lawrence Durrell, of course, was British. And he wrote, uh, you know, a group of books that were the exact same story told from a number of different perspectives. Mm. Each, uh, the, so you think in book number one that you've read it and you understand it, and then you read book number two, but it's taken from a different person's perspective. Same story, uh -huh. third and fourth. Uh -huh. And I read that when I was quite young, and I thought, oh my God, this is just fabulous. <coughs> Excuse me. And it was really wonderful. I, I, I think that he, he definitely influenced me. And there were several other British uh, authors. I like British authors mystery writers uh, who, they have a different perspective. A, a lot of what they write also has a natural influence. In other words, they write from nature. Their villages always yeah. play a big part in what they're doing. Uh, the weather mm -hmm. definitely dominates in many ways. It's always raining or thunder <clears> or something, <throat> which is uh, something that I think, I, I unfortunately, if somebody says, oh, she's copying that British author, they may have a point not copying, but influenced by, because mm -hmm. I do think weather uh, plays a part in mood, both from the perspective of the uh, writer or the protagonist in the story, as well as from the reader who says, yeah, I understand how it is out mm -hmm. there. It's raining and it's gloomy and could be a murder over there <clears throat> taking place. How, how did you decide that there would be a single protagonist who would go through each of those six different life experiences? It, it, it's... It sounds like uh, I planned it, but I, I didn't. I mean, I want to be really so honest. So once you it's established just, her in the first book, she just it just seemed natural for her. To it just in? she just she just went along. Yeah, and of she, course she has become your alter ego. She is my alter ego, right? And of is, course, is, the it, husband, is this autobiographical? Uh, oh Lord, no. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> well, you what live a on time. the main line. You know a lot of people. Well, on the I main do, line. but uh, you know, and I try. If I do put them in the book, it's usually well disguised because I don't want them to, yeah. to feel that they've yeah. uh, in, in any way been embarrassed. 
places. You, you mentioned Rosalie's, the restaurant in Wayne. Yes. You mentioned uh, Whole Foods, but in a slightly different context. Right. Yeah, they're somewhat oblique, but many of them are not so oblique. Oh, yes. And then, of course, in one of the other books, I had one of our favorite diners. Uh, Mil Manellas. Manellas. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in that one, it, of course, there was cherry pie that was became part of the mystery. Uh -huh. And uh, did they give I, you a free meal for that? No, <laughs> you know. But you know what they did? I came in, and this uh, waitress came up and she said, "You're the one that writes the books." And I said, "Yes." She said, "You know that cherry pie? Everybody asks for cherry pie." <laughs> and I said, "Well, as a matter of fact, that's why I came. I want yeah. my cherry pie." But uh, they are fun, yeah. and they are real places. Well, I, I teach a class of high school seniors. It's mm -hmm. just it's fun to do. I teach a course in innovation and entrepreneurship. And a couple of them have expressed an interest. When I asked them, what, what do you want to do with your life? A couple of them have said they think they might like to write. Good. <clears throat> Good. What advice do you give to an aspiring writer? Uh, not necessarily a journalist, yes. but somebody who wants, wants to I want to write a book. Well, I, I'm going to tell you, I think that they should start writing as soon as possible. I started writing when I was in high school, a freshman. Uh, I Short went, stories? No. I, I started writing for a local, for the newspaper, for the, um, I went to Holy Angels Academy to start with, and the nuns had a newspaper, mm -hmm. and they wanted <clears throat> volunteers, and sister said, you're volunteering. Yeah. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So that was my first, my first so-called journalistic job, and that really, uh, I, I thought I liked this. Yeah. You know, I got to sit down and talk to people and then write about it for the paper, and I got my name on it. That was pretty special. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly I, I really began to like it a lot. I would really start kids writing as soon as possible. Yeah. And if if you ever invite me to come to your class, I'll tell them that. You are going to be invited. Oh, you, thank you. You didn't know that, but you are going to be invited. <laughs> I, I remember my first byline. I was writing for a weekly. Yes. When I think I was back in college or something. Uh -huh. And I brought it home. And, and it, this is the honest to God truth. The story was I covered a, a township meeting. And, and you know how they can. Yes. And the, and the story was about a dog who bit a man. You know? Really? Yeah. Dog bites <laughs> man, bad. headline. And my mother, she couldn't understand how I had a Bible. How much did that cost? How'd you, how'd you do that? <laughs> uh, those were the good old days. Uh, your seventh book, which is already in the offing, is that yes. an extension of, or you say it's, it's completely it's again, different? Well, it, it, it's a very... A dramatic book. It's called Blood Bonds, and it's uh, written very personally. It's the difference, Rick, would be that in this book, in Visions, uh, Jessica is going out again to solve the world. What happens when the world comes to Jessica, and she mm. finds out that she is the center of the universe in terms of this mystery? Uh, that is a very provocative. Mm internal mm -hmm. uh, war because none of us like to think that we're the center of something that's evil and nasty and horrible, yeah. especially when we've never had any reason to think that we were and have never done anything to cause it. And yet that I think is the most, probably most intriguing way to kind of write this, whether it's going to be a mm -hmm. final book or not on this particular series. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give up writing, but if I finish the series with this one, you can believe me, it's going to go out with a bang. Mm -hmm. you know, she's, she's not going to go out I, easily. Uh, Visions will be released? We hope very soon in time for Christmas. Right, and will be available? On Amazon.com. <clears throat> Look for the new cover, which will be beautiful, bright red and mm -hmm. gleaming. Uh, and we hope from some local bookstores, uh, I really pray that they've survived the COVID because we love our local bookstores and want them to be survivals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what else are you doing? <laughs> in my spare time. Yeah. Well, in my spare time, I have been having a wonderful summer out in my garden and just enjoying the warm weather. Right, and right. You've earned it. You had a tough patch there for a long time. It, it was, but uh, it's it's new now. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you back. Oh, Thank Rick, you. it's so good to see you. And so good to have her talk. <laughs> yeah. My guest today has been Barbara Clement, a celebrated mainline author, whose latest book, Visions, will be available soon on Amazon and any other bookstore that yes. still has their doors open. Until next time, this is 30 Minutes. I'm Rick Anthony. Take very good care of yourselves.